Okay, can everyone see my slides? Yeah, we can yeah, see your yeah, slides. Okay, perfect. All right, so right now we're just going to start with doing kind of the upper GI side. Um, and if you guys have any questions throughout any of the presentation, feel free to kind of um, drop your questions in the chat and we'll try and answer them at the end of the tutorial. So I'm just going to start up with upper GI. So we're going to start with um, GORD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, now, this is basically um, when there's kind of acid in the stomach that kind of comes up into the esophagus and it causes these esophageal symptoms. Um, the main symptom that we kind of try and elicit in a history is that retrosternal discomfort or heartburn felt by most patients, um, as well as acid rash, which is basically acid regurgitation. Um, from the stomach up into the esophagus and also water brush, which is kind of salivation as a response to this acid coming up and also adenophagia, which is basically pain when swallowing. And some patients may feel this as kind of discomfort and others may say that this kind of feels like a lump um, more so in kind of the throat area. Now, in terms of kind of red flag symptoms and stuff to watch out for, um, like very severe gourd can cause dysphagia. So that's kind of like an inability to kind of swallow in general. And as just a rule of thumb, if this does occur, we need to refer the patient under the two week referral, just kind of as a kind of cancer referral pathway, even though it does appear as the patient may have gourd, we just need to do this as a precaution. So the diagnosis is, as I said, mainly clinical. Um, patients are given a trial of a PPI, and this can be both diagnosis and for treatment. Now, if kind of the symptoms do continue, um, we do an OGD, but the actual gold standard is the esophageal pH monitoring and also manometry, but manometry is primarily also using ecclesia as well. Um, so patients can also have extra esophageal symptoms. Um, this could be nocturnal asthma, a chronic cough, laryngitis and sinusitis. And this is primarily because of the acid irritating kind of the larynx and also causing kind of coughing at nighttime as well. So in terms of the management of gourd, so mostly it's conservative. So kind of advising the patient towards kind of um, improving their diets, avoiding things that may irritate kind of the stomach, um, such as spicy food, alcohol, and smoking, um, and medical as well. So antacids and alginates. So Gaviscon that can also be purchased over the counter. And then other medications such as PPI, such as omeprazole. And in extreme cases, surgery can also be a resort, um, such as the Nissen fundoplication. Um, this is basically when a, um, the stomach is used to kind of wrap around the lower esophageal sphincter and create kind of a more tight seal to stop or prevent the acid contents from coming up into the esophagus. Okay, so moving on to Barrett's esophagus now. So Barrett's esophagus is characterized by metaplasia of the lower esophageal, esophageal mucosa. So normally this is a squamous epithelium lining. However, in Barrett's, this is replaced by a columnar epithelium. Um, metaplasia is basically um, when a cell type is kind of exchanged for another cell type that is not supposed to be in that area. Now, um, there is an increased risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma. And an adenocarcinoma is basically when um, a columnar epithelium develops into a malignant growth. Um, the length of the affected segment correlates strongly um, with the chances of identifying the metaplasia as well. So the main risk factors for Barrett's are gauze, so esophageal reflux, um, male gender smoking, um, and central obesity. And the main kind of way we kind of diagnose this is through an OGD where we can actually see um, the squamous epithelium being replaced by the columnar epithelium. Um, so in terms of the management of Barrett's, so if metaplasia is found, um, we offer endoscopic surveillance with biopsies every three to five years. Now, if we find dysplasia of any grade or any size, um, we need to kind of take further action. Um, this could be radiofrequency ablation 
or endoscopic mucosa resection. Now resection is used if the kind of lesion is quite big and if there's just a cluster of few cells we prefer to do a radiofrequency ablation um, and just kind of clarify dysplasia is when there's kind of abnormal cellular architecture and that tells us the difference between metaplasia and dysplasia on kind of a histological level. Okay so moving on to peptic ulcer disease now. So as we kind of known, ulcer is like a sore and these are in the lining of the stomach or the upper parts of the small intestine. Um, so there's kind of main two types really. The most common one is the duodenal ulcer, which is the most common. Um, and the type, the kind of pain classification is very important for exams. So for duodenal ulcers, we get an epigastric pain. However, this is relieved after eating food. Um, and in terms of a gastric ulcer, which is present in the stomach, we get epigastric pain as well. However, it is worsened uh, by eating. Now, the risk factors for developing a peptic ulcer are H. pylori or helicobacter um, pylori infections, drugs such as NSAIDs and SSRIs, um, steroids and bisphosphonates, and something, a very kind of rare syndrome called zollinger ellison syndrome. And this is basically kind of the excess production of gastrin, and this causes kind of excess acid to accumulate in the stomach. And obviously this is gonna irritate um, the lining. So in terms of our investigations, an OGD is also very useful because we can have a look inside the stomach to see whereabouts this ulcer is. Um, and also it's essential to rule out H. pylori as well. So we normally use the urea breath test. Um, you can use a stool antigen as well to identify if a patient is infected with H. pylori, which we need to treat immediately. So peptic ulcers can have a lot of complications, um, such as bleeding and perforation. So perforation is basically when the peptic ulcer kind of buries so deep into the stomach lining that it actually does cause perforation in the actual stomach lining. So the main symptoms of this is epigastric pain, uh, peritonitic pain, which is quite a well-localized pain, and in extreme cases, syncope. Um, it's very important important to get an erect chest x-ray um, and we can see air underneath the diaphragm in this x-ray here as you can kind of see this kind of underneath um, the diaphragm um, and the management is quite kind of an emergency management and normally surgery um, is integrated somewhere in the management of a perforation. Um, another complication is hemorrhage. So this is basically just the bleeding peptic ulcer. So the patient may have hematomesis which is basically where the patient is vomiting up blood or melina, which is kind of the passage of digested blood um, through the back passage of the patient. Um, as the blood is kind of from the stomach, it gets digested and passes out of the patient in the form of melina instead of just direct um, blood per rectum. Um, patients may be anemic, there may be a drop in hemoglobin, and there's also raised urea because of the protein meal or the digest digesting of the protein um, from the blood. So um, this is quite, quite important to kind of know um, how the different causes of hematemesis um, kind of present. So as we said, in peptic ulcer disease, um, the patient may be already on an NSAID they may be infected with H. pylori, um, normally small volume bleeds, um, and patients may, may pre present with iron deficiency anemia. Um, Boer harvest syndrome. So this is the rupture of the esophagus. So it's not just a tear. This is the rupture of the esophagus, and this is a medical emergency. Um, so kind of facts to kind of pick up in the history. Um, so an alcoholic perhaps vomiting a lot, acute chest pain, and subcutaneous emphysema. So basically air trapped underneath the skin, and this kind of gives kind of a bubble wrap or crepitus noise as well. Um, Mallory Weiss tears are also tears in the esophagus, and these are kind of prolong following prolonged vomiting bouts, such as alcoholics as well. Um, the vomit kind of seems to have been like streaked with blood as well. Um, in terms of malignancy, um, 
This is normally kind of a pre-terminal event where the cancer has actually eroded into a vessel. Um, and we can also look out for constitutional and red flag symptoms such as weight loss and night sweats too. Um, and in terms of esophageal variceal bleeding, uh, we look out for signs of kind of liver cirrhosis, homelessness, IVD use, ascites and splenomegaly. And um, variceal bleeding is also a medical emergency with large volumes of blood as well. So in terms of the management of an upper GI bleed, we normally will follow the ABCDE uh, protocol because this is, as I said, a medical emergency. Um, in terms of risk assessing pac patients at and in the acute setting, we use the Blackford score. And this tells us whether we can kind of manage the patient as an inpatient or kind of an outpatient. Um, and then after the endoscopy, we use the Rockhall score, which gives us or tells us the risk of the patient having a rebleed or presenting again um, with the same pathology. So in terms of our acute management, we would need to insert two wide ball cannulae in the patient because obviously they're going to be quite fluid depleted. We'd give them an IV crystalloid infusion such as um, sodium chloride. Um, we'd give them some blood as well as they're losing blood through hematonesis. Um, so O negative, cross matching, and then we'd need to kind of transfuse them as well as a further measure. So if the platelets are less than 50, um, we normally give platelets. Um, if the fibrinogen is less than one, we'd normally give fresh frozen plasma or FFP. And if the patient is on warfarin, we'd give our prothrombin complex and vitamin K. Um, now, if the patient has a variceal bleed, we'd also give intravenous terlipressin and an antibiotic such as ciprofloxacin. Um, and for all our patients, we need to arrange an urgent OGD within 24 hours um, and correct the pathology. So if we find kind of a uh, peptic ulcer, we need to give a PPI after the endoscopy. Um, and if the patient is having a variceal bleed, um, we'd need to give some band ligation or something like that. Okay, so I'm just going to run through some questions briefly. So I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds to read through the question. Um, and then you can kind of like develop your answer. And then after that, I'm just going to be going over. Okay, so I'm just going to be going over the answer now. So the answer is tetracycline. So this is just a fact that is quite essential to learn. And it is that tetracyclines kind of cause discoloration um, in teeth in children. So we don't normally give them to children. And also if mothers take them while they're pregnant, um, there's a chance that there can be kind of bone problems and discoloration in the child as well. Okay, so I'm going to be moving on to the next question. Okay, so I'm going to be moving on to the answer now. Okay, so the answer is actually endoscopy. So from reading this SBA style question, um, we can kind of say the patient may have ecclesia, or that could be quite high up in our differentials. Um, however, because patient has presented with dysphagia, we need to refer the patient under the two-week pathway 
for an OGD. Um, this is just what we have to do, or the protocol um, for a supposed esophageal cancer. So if the patient has dysphagia or aged over 55 with weight loss or any other upper abdominal pain with reflux or dyspepsia, we arrange two week um, two week referral for this. Um, so that's just another protocol that we need to follow. Um, I'm going to be moving on to the next question now. Okay, so the answer is a barren swallow. Um, this is the most definitive investigation for um, a hiatus hernia. Um, now, there are kind of two types of main hiatus hernia that we need to be aware of. So we have the sliding and the rolling. So this is a diagram of both of them. So the sliding um, hernia is actually the most common one. And this is where the stomach herniates over the diaphragm um, and the kind of gastroesophageal junction is kind of above the diaphragm instead of below. Um, and this kind of causes kind of a lot of refluxing symptoms in the patient. Um, we also have our rolling hernia, and this is where kind of a different area of the stomach herniates through uh, the diaphragm up near the esophagus as well. Um, so normally would give a PPI to deal with the symptoms, but if this doesn't work, we can also resort to surgery as well. And people kind of develop hernias for all sorts of reasons, but increasing um, intra-abdominal pressure, such as obesity, um, can make this more likely. Okay. Okay, so the answer was a BMI of 36. So this is just another one to be aware of or another one to learn, um, the risk factors of developing an esophageal adenocarcinoma. So the rest of these are kind of risk factors um, of developing a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so it's just important to kind of know which factors kind of are leading to the development of which type of um, esophageal cancer. Okay, so this would be a duodenal ulcer. Um, remember how I said it's quite important to kind of characterize the pain um, in kind of peptic ulcers because if it's an epigastric pain, that doesn't tell us much. However, because it is relieved after meals, it makes it more likely that it's a duodenal ulcer. Um, in terms of a gastric carcinoma, um, it says in the stem that there's no history of weight loss. And I know this isn't enough to kind of rule out a gastric carcinoma, but it makes it a bit less unlikely considering kind of the pattern and the pain presented in the stem of the question.
Okay, so the answer was E. Okay, so this is basically the treatment for H. pylori, or we call it eradication um, treatment. So the one in 52 just means one week's worth of treatment. So normally the treatment is seven days long. Um, so amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and lanzoprazole. Now, the reason why we don't use metronidazole in this case is because our patient is kind of a chronic alcohol, chronic alcoholic, and metronidazole um, in alcoholics can actually cause a disulfiram-like reaction where there's like flushing, hypertension, nausea. So we try and stay away from using um, the, those antibiotics. So this is kind of the answer we would get to from elimination. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly run through some oral pathology as well, which is really important to know. Um, so, so number one or A is angular stomatitis. Um, so this is kind of very common in iron deficiency anemia. Um, that is kind of the main thing to look out for in terms of angular stomatitis. I was associated with iron deficiency anemia. However, it can be present with denture problems and candida, just to be aware of that as well. Um, B is oral pigmentation. So this is kind of like freckling on the lips, which is quite characteristic of Peach Jagers. Um, Addison's and also melanoma as well. Um, C is gingival hyperplasia. So this is basically, as you can kind of see, the gums have kind of hypertrophied. Um, they look quite swollen. And this is a side effect of phenytoin. Um, cyclosporin um, can also be caused by acute myeloid leukemia and scurvy as well. Um, D is oral candidiasis, so we can kind of see these patches of candida growing in the oral cavity. Um, I normally associate this with immunocompromised mm -hmm. patients, so those who have perhaps HIV or on kind of chemotherapy. However, it can also be caused by a lack of oral hygiene as well. Um, e is oral leukoplakia, so you can kind of see these kind of white lesions as well on the tongue. Um, this is normally a pre-malignant transformation, can cause oral squamous cell carcinoma, or it can develop into that. Um, and F is aphthous ulcers. So this is kind of synonymous in exam questions with Crohn's disease. So I want you guys to remember that aphthous ulcers, I would think Crohn's disease. However, it also is present in Bechet's as well, which is kind of a rheumatological disease. Um, herpes zoster and celiac disease can also cause ulcers in the mouth as well. OK, so um, I don't think we're going to be taking a five minute break at the moment, but we will take it at the end of the next sessions. Um, and in the meantime, could you just please scan this QR code? We really love to hear some feedback as well. So we're going to be moving on to the next session now. OK, yeah, so hi, guys, I'm Max. I'm just going to try to share my screen quickly. Um, so can everyone see that, the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, we can see it. And is it full screened as well? Yeah. OK, cool. Yeah. So I'll be going through hepatology and it's quite a long section, this. So we'll take a break right before the SBAs, but I'll try to get through most of it because there is quite a lot to cover. So the first condition we're going to cover is alcoholic liver disease. And this is more of an umbrella term for a spectrum of conditions. So the first stage is alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this is characterized by something called hepatic steatosis. And this is when you get fatty infiltrates within the liver and between the hepatocytes. If this is chronic or severe enough, this can then cause alcoholic hepatitis, which is an inflammation of the uh, hepatocytes in the liver. And then if this is left untreated, or again, it becomes very severe, you can then get liver cirrhosis, which is permanent scarring and fibrosis of the liver, which is untreatable and can only really be treated by um, a full liver transplant. So a common presentation for these kind of patients would be, or a common AKT question would be a patient comes in, they either have a history of severe alcohol use or they come in smelling of alcohol and then they'll come in with the symptoms of kind of jaundice, right upper quadrant pain, potentially ascites, 
your kind of classic liver uh, symptoms. So your most important investigation for this would be your LFTs. Um, that's kind of one of your main three bloods, so FBCs, using these and LFTs. And I'll quickly take you through the LFT. So there's five main things you can get in an LFT, which is your AST and AOT. These are your transaminases. And if you ever see these raised, it points more towards a hepatic or a liver condition. You can also get bilirubin. Um, this can be raised in a variety of conditions. And then you also get gamma, G, uh, gamma GT and ALP, so alkaline phosphatase. <clears throat> and these will point towards a more cholestatic picture. So either a blockage within the biliary system um, and not necessarily a hepatic or a liver condition. So in alcoholic liver disease, what you want to look out for is a raised AST and AOT. And what you can find is sometimes in a lot of AKT questions and a lot of pass med questions, the AST will be two times as much as the AOT. However, I've heard in practice this isn't as much of a thing and it's not commonly seen. But for your AKTs, definitely keep that in mind. So I know I said before, gamma GT is more of a cholestatic um, marker. However, alcohol itself can raise gamma GT alone. So if you ever see AST, AOT raised, and then gamma GT raised as well, don't get kind of thrown off and think it's cholestatic because the gamma GT will be raised by alcohol itself. So then the second investigation you want to consider is a hepatic ultrasound. And these can aid with your diagnosis, but more importantly, if the patient has come to the point where they have a cirrhotic liver, then you'd want to do an ultrasound every six to 12 months because liver cirrhosis is a really high risk factor for patients developing hepatocellular carcinomas. And I don't know if you guys can unmute yourselves or put it in the chat, but does, does anyone know the marker for hepatocellular carcinomas? Because it's one of those ones you need to know. Um, I'll just try and check the chat. Or you can shout out. Um, no, so the market is alpha feta protein. It, it's, a, it's more of an oncology question, but it is one of those markers that you need to know for fourth year and can come up in your AKTs. So then the management for alcoholic liver disease. If you're at the alcoholic fatty liver disease stage, then it's more conservative management. So you have things like alcohol abstinence, and then also when you do alcohol abstinence, you want to treat the withdrawal symptoms. So you'd give benzodiazepines like chlordiazepoxide, and you'd also give Pabrinex, which is a mixture of vitamin B and C, because this can prevent a condition called Wernicke's encephalopathy, which you'll learn more about in neurology, but it's just something to keep in mind. Also, you want to look at things like weight reduction. You'd also want to give these patients their immunizations and their vaccines, so influenza, pneumococcal, hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccines. And then if you get to the point where the patient has alcoholic hepatitis, you want to consider things like steroids um, to reduce that inflammation. And like I said, if the patient gets to the cirrhotic stage and their liver becomes decompensated, you then want to look into the patient getting transplants. So the next condition is autoimmune hepatitis. This commonly presents in younger females, and they will commonly come in with another autoimmune condition, such as Graves' disease, vitiligo, rheumatoid arthritis. The common symptoms, again, are very common liver hepatic symptoms, so jaundice, right upper quadrant pain, fevers. And then a common presentation you can also see with this is amenorrhea, which is kind of a lack of periods. Um, so investigations what you'd want to do is obviously LFTs. This, that's going to kind of be the answer for every one of these uh, conditions. Again, you'd see a raised AOT and AST. You'd also see a raised bilirubin. You may also see a raised AOP, but that's not always the case. Uh, and then with autoimmune hepatitis, as it's an autoimmune condition, you would want to look at some antibodies that kind of act as markers for the condition, which we'll get into in a second. And then with a lot of liver conditions as well, the definitive gold standard investigation is a biopsy in which with autoimmune hepatitis, you'd see something called piecemeal necrosis. So the antibodies you want to look at, the most common one is type 1, and it's called anti-smooth muscle. This is definitely one you want to know before you go into your AKTs, because it's quite it's the most common one for autoimmune hepatitis, and it's kind of the most common presentation. Then you've also got type 2 and type 3, which are anti-liver kidney microsomal antibodies and soluble liver antigen. Um, these tend to be more rare, so I wouldn't worry about them as, as much. 
but definitely know them going into your AKTs. And then the management, obviously, as it's inflammation, you want to look at using steroids. If it becomes very severe or resistant to the steroids, you want to add immunosuppressants onto this. And then if you get something called decompensated liver cirrhosis, which is a um, core, which can happen from autoimmune hepatitis, you then want to look into liver transplants, but we'll get onto that a bit later in the presentation. So then you've got your viral hepatitis, which are very common and will probably be examined on in some form. So we'll start with the acute ones. So these are hepatitis A and hepatitis E. They present very similarly, and you can also catch them very similarly, so the fecal oral transmission. So this includes things like uh, shellfish. If a patient has an occupation which is to do with sewage, this is a potential way to catch these conditions. And then also things like oral anal sex. So men who have sex with men are at high risk of contracting hepatitis A and E. Um, the incubate, incubation periods are slightly different, so you've got two to four weeks for hep A, three to eight weeks for hep E. And a common AKT question specific to hepatitis E is that the mortality is much higher in pregnancy. So if you ever see um, a woman presenting with, you know, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain, any symptoms that might make you think of a hepatic condition, you always want to think of hepatitis E kind of above everything else, unless there's something points you in another direction. So the symptoms, again, as it's an infection, you're going to have flu-like symptoms, so fevers. You're also going to have your common liver, uh, liver symptoms, so jaundice, potentially ascites. And then your investigations, of course, an LFT. Um, that shouldn't say cholestatic results, that should say hepatic results. Um, and then you also want to look at your markers, so hepatitis A, IgM, and hepatitis E, IgM. And then your management for these, there's no specific treatment for them. Hep A does have vaccines, whereas Hep E doesn't. Um, and then you've got your chronic hepatitis. So hepatitis B is the most common one in the world. Around one in 20 people affected with acute Hep B can go on to develop chronic hepatitis. And this is basically when you've had the um, condition for more than six months. Again, the um, presentation will be very similar to a lot of liver conditions in terms of fever, jaundice, and your elevated transaminases, so AST, ALT. Some risk factors are men who have sex with men, IV drug use, and endemic areas. Uh, some investigations, you'd want to do serology, um, and you'd also see a ground glass hepatocytes when you do the biopsy and light microscopy. The treatments are peg pegylated interferon alpha and antivirals, but I'm not sure how kind of successful these are. And then hep C is the most common in Europe. So your investigations would be hepatitis C, RNA. There are currently no vaccines and a few complications of contracting hep C are things like cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinomas, membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. So again, if someone has chronic hep C, you would want to do ultrasounds every six to 12 months just to screen for um, carcinomas of the liver. And then liver cirrhosis. This is quite an important topic, especially for your AKTs and abdominal exams for your OSCEs maybe. So this is basically kind of permanent scarring of the liver or diffuse fibrosis and structural abnormalities. The common causes are alcohol, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and viral hepatitis. However, any condition we've discussed can kind of eventually lead to liver cirrhosis if it's either left untreated for long enough or if it's severe enough. And there are two stages to cirrhosis. So you've got the compensated cirrhosis and decompensated. And compensated is basically when the patient has cirrhosis of their liver, but the liver function is still maintained, so you won't get full um, liver failure. So you'd tend to present with symptoms like fatigue, anorexia, nausea, spider nevi, and terry nails. And then if the liver has completely decompensated, so there's very little to no liver function left, you'll get things like ascites, edema, jaundice, pruritus, palmar erythema, and gynecomastia. If you haven't heard of them, we'll go into those slightly later. Um, so some investigations, you'd obviously want to do your LFTs. And the thing about LFTs are if you see a raised AST and ALT, they're not necessarily markers for um, the severity of a condition or the liver function. What you'd also want to ask for is your albumin and your prothrombin time, because these two things are more markers for how, how much liver function is actually remaining. They're not necessarily markers for disease. They're markers for how good the liver is still functioning and how severe the condition is. 
You'd also want to get your normal blood, so your use knees and FBCs, so you can see things like uh, decreasing platelets or hyponatremia. Um, but I'd worry about those two less. And you also want to check for your Hep B and Hep C uh, viral screens. Then in terms of imaging, you'd want to do a fibro scan to see the extent of the cirrhosis and fibrosis. And you'd also want to do a liver ultrasound, again, to see the extent of the disease, but also monitor for any hepatocellular carcinomas. And finally, you'd want to do endoscopy. This is less so to do with the liver. So the form of endoscopy you'd want to do would be a gastroscopy, in which you insert a camera through the mouth to look at the esophagus and the stomach. And the reason for this is you want to make sure the patient doesn't have any kind of viruses, because they're quite common and very um, severe um, complication of extensive liver cirrhosis. So portal hypertension, this is quite an important topic as well. The acronym SAVE stands for the signs you can get when you have fully decompensated liver cirrhosis from portal hypertension. So the S is splenomegaly, the A is ascites, the V is varices, and the E is encephalopathy, so hepatic encephalopathy. Um, we'll go into those four uh, signs in the next few slides. But so basically what portal hypertension is, is it's when, as you can see in the graph on the right, you have the portal vein which goes to the liver, and it's when you have an increased blood pressure within the portal vein. And this can be caused by kind of three main categories that cause portal um, hypertension. So you've got your prehepatic causes, and this is kind of thromboembolisms and blockages of the portal vein, which lead to an increased um, blood pressure. You can get your hepatic causes. So these are things like cirrhosis um, and any kind of liver conditions. And then you can get your post-hepatic causes. So these are less to do with the portal vein itself, but more so to do with the, um, the hepatic vein, which is from the liver to the heart. So you've got things like right-sided heart failure, because if the right side of the heart isn't pumping as strongly, you can get a backup and a buildup of blood, which can cause the hepatic portal vein to become backlogged with blood, therefore increasing the pressure. And you can also get things like Budgiari syndrome, which is when you get a blockage of those veins that uh, occur after the liver. And again, you can get a backflow of blood and a blockage causing just an increase in blood pressure in the hepatic, uh, in the portal vein. And I'll go on to the, and so some things to consider is the increased intrahepatic vascular resistance portal flow can lead to an increased um, portal hypertension. And then this can cause portosystemic collateral vascularization. So this is a um, basically branches of collateral vessels that branch off of the portal vein. Uh, kind of around the liver to almost bypass the liver and relieve some of that um, increased blood pressure. So the first thing to look at is splenomegaly. So this can be caused by portal hypertension, which if I go back, as you can see, the splenic vein connects onto the portal vein. So if you have an increase in blood pressure in the portal vein, you get a backlog of blood, which can cause the, which can cause blood to build up in the spleen and then cause the spleen to become enlarged, which is what splenomegaly is. Um, and as the spleen is involved in breaking down platelets, you can get, get, then get platelet sec sequestration, leading to thrombocytopenia. So there's three main ways to categorize um, splenomegaly. You have mild splenomegaly, in which it's slightly enlarged. You've got moderate, in which it's very enlarged, but it doesn't cross the midline. And then you've got massive in which it fully crosses the midline. And this is kind of when you would very easily feel it on any kind of abdominal examination. So potentially for your OSCEs, if you were asked to do an abdominal examination, it's unlikely that you get a patient with splenomegaly, but you may be asked about some causes of splenomegaly. So the main one you'd want to say is portal hypertension. But then some other ones you'd want to consider would be hematological causes. So chronic myeloid leukemia and myelofibrosis, which you'll cover later in hematology. You can get storage diseases, which is Gouch's disease, which is very niche and I wouldn't worry about that too much. You can also get infections such as visceral leash manias and malaria. And then some other important causes that you should consider is lymphoma, obviously your portal hypertension, um, your sickle cell disease, Felty syndrome, which is a rheumatoid condition, is quite a niche one, but it's characterized by a triad of splenomegaly, rheumatoid arthritis, and neutropenia. So it's quite a good one to just have in your OSCEs in case someone asks you for a cause of um, splenomegaly. And then you've also got other infections such as Epstein-Barr virus and hepatitis. 
So another important sign is ascites, and you can definitely be asked about this in your OSCEs. So in terms of portal hypertension, you can get a back pressure of um, fluid building up, which would lead to fluid exudation, so fluid leakage, which will um, cause reduced extracellular volume and then lead to the activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone syndrome. So if a patient comes in with ascites, one of the first things you'd want to do would be to take a sample of this ascites. Uh, and this would be done by a paracentesis in which you insert a, ne a needle into the peritoneal cavity and you take some of the ascites out to send off for a sample. And whenever you do this, you also, when you take out ascites, there's a lot of albumin in them, which is kind of almost maintaining the oncotic pressure within the vessels. So what you want to do is when you do paracentesis and remove some of the ascites, you do want to also give something called human albumin solution, which maintains the albumin levels within the blood so that you don't get an increase in volume in fluid coming out of the blood. And the reason you'd want to take some of these ascites and some of the acidic fluid is you'd want to send it off for something called SARG interpretation. And this is this basically stands for serum ascites albumin gradient, in which you measure the levels of albumin in the blood and the acid and the acidic fluid and so as you can see here if you measure it and the ratio comes out at greater than or equal to one to one uh, 1.1 1 .1, then the cause is likely to be due to portal hypertension uh, so you need to consider things like cirrhosis liver mets right-sided heart failure but syndrome and sbp or spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and if it comes out as less than one it would be kind of an other cause, so you can get neoplasias, inflammation, nephrotic syndrome, and infection. <coughs> and then in terms of your management, the first things you'd want to do is fluid restriction so, and also decrease their sodium intake, as this can kind of cause more um, fluid to leak out of the vessels. You'd also want to look at things like aldosterone antagonists, so spironolactone. And if this is refractory, then you'd want to do a TIPS procedure. Uh, which we'll get onto later, and also give um, IV albumin. And then one thing to consider in any patients who have ascites is something called bacterial, um, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, in which this is an infection of the acidic fluid, and it's most commonly caused by E. coli. And what will happen is you'll take a sample of the ascites, send it off to the microbiology lab, and they'll test it for um, kind of any bugs or bacteria that could be causing it. And if they come back positive, your treatment will be IV cefotaxamine or prophylactic quinoline. Um, and then the another side effect of portal hypertension is varices, which we kind of discussed earlier. So again, this is something that could come up in your OSCEs or because it's a very common cause of an upper GI bleed. So if a patient were to present with varices, the first thing you'd want to do would be to do a full A to E examination. Um, you know, assess their airways, breathing, circulation, disabilities, and uh, kind of everything else. Then if variceal bleeds are suspected, if they're shocked, you would want to go down the resuscitation route, so fluid boluses and all of those kind of things. But if they aren't in shock, then you'd want to give IV terlipressin, which is known as a splanchnic vasoconstrictor. So what this basically does is it constricts the splanchnic vessels, which include your splenic vessels, um, and the inferior and superior mesentric vessels. And then you'd also want to give um, prophylactic antibiotics, so IV ciprofloxacin. Then you'd want to get an OGD, so esophagogastroduodenoscopy, completed within 24 hours. Um, in common practice, apparently it's a lot quicker, but in an AKT or an OSCE situation, you want to say just within the first 24 hours of presentation. And with this, you would try and do banding. So you basically tie bands around the vessels that have been bleeding or protruding to prevent any kind of further bleeding. And if that doesn't work, you'd go into IV sclerotherapy. If this doesn't work, you then do exsanguination using a Sensdaken Blakemore tube, which is this thing on the bottom left, in which you insert a tube into down the esophagus into the stomach and you kind of blow it up like a balloon and it compresses on the esophagus, preventing any kind of further bleeding. And then if either it recurs or it's refractory to this, you would then call in, I believe, the general surgeons to do a TIPS procedure, which stands for trans, um, trans intrahepatic, intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. 
um, which is when you connect the portal vein to the hepatic vein and you bypass the liver um, to kind of reduce that portal hypertension and try and stop the bleeding from the varices or reduce the bleeding. And then once this has all been um, kind of fixed, you would then want to give uh, IV propan oh, well, oral propanolol as an act of prophylaxis to prevent further bleeds. And then one of the final things you need to worry about is hepatic encephalopathy. And this is basically when the cirrhosis and the poor liver function reduces the amount of toxins that are broken, um, that are removed from the blood by the liver. This can then cause ammonia to accumulate in the brain, in which the, the astrocytes in the brain can then break down glutamate into glutamine, increasing the oncotic um, pressure within the vascular system of the brain and you'll lead to osmotic imbalance and then you'll get cerebral edema. So these patients will present with a lot of CNS symptoms, so like confusion and things like that. And the most common causes are acute liver failure. You can get TIPS, which actually causes this as well. So the TIPS procedure, because obviously as you're bypassing the liver, you then get kind of almost next to no liver function. Um, constipation can cause it, hypoglycemia, toxins and infections. And then the management of any patient that comes in with this is you want to avoid the use of sedatives or opioids as it can worsen the condition itself. You want to give lactulose, which is a laxative, and it kind of basically removes any excess um, feces in the bowels and prevents more ammonia um, absorption. You then also want to give a phosphate enema potentially as it has the same kind of laxative effect. And then as prophylaxis or also a second line, you'd give rifaximin, which is an uh, antibiotic, and it basically kills your gut's microflora and prevents them from absorbing more ammonia into the bloodstream. Then you can grade this. So your grade zero is kind of normal without neurodeficits or almost no encephalopathy. Your grade one is impaired attention span. Grade two is disorientated, and you have asterisks, which is when you put your hands out in front of you and you can't get a tremor. Um, grade three is somnolent but arousable and also slurring of the words, so kind of confusion. This is when you'll start to see the GCS, the GCS drop quite a bit. And then grade four is your coma, um, so the patient will be completely comatosed. And yeah, so these are what the asterisks, the asterisks, asterisks are. Um, there is quite a lot to cover, so I'll try and go through this as quickly as I can. So you've also got Wilson's disease, which is caused by a mutation in ATP7B gene on chromosome 13. It's basically a disorder of hepatic copper excretion um, in which you can deposit copper into parts of the body. So the brain and the liver are the two most common places. And you can also get it in the eyes. So this picture on the top right is something called the Kaiser Fleischer ring. So you won't really see these with the naked eye. You can, but it's quite rare and it would have to be very severe for you to see them. It's more commonly seen with like a slit lamp. Um, so some common kind of uh, signs you can see would be acute hepatitis and liver cirrhosis. It's also a differential for Parkinson's. So if you get Parkinson's symptoms in a young patient, you would want to consider Wilson's disease as a potential differential. You can also get Kaiser Fleischer rings, which are the thing you saw in the top right in the eye. And you'd also get blue nails, which is the other image. You can get chondrocalcinosis, so this will be seen on x-ray, um, osteoporosis, and you can also get type 2 renal tubular acidosis, or it's otherwise known as Fanconi syndrome, but you'll see, you'll cover that more in your nephrology rotation. Um, so some investigations would be a decreased serum copper and a decreased serum ceruloplasmin, and you would think they'd normally be raised, but as you're excreting a lot of the copper, it comes out of the blood and it's deposited in the liver and the brain and in the eyes. So it will actually be decreased. Uh, with 24-hour urinary copper, it will be raised. And on a liver biopsy, you would see a raised copper level. Um, in terms of management, so you would give penicillamine. So this is a um, copper chelating agent. So it kind of binds to the copper, preventing it from being deposited elsewhere in the body. You would also want to consider liver transplants as if the patient has severe cirrhosis or severe copper deposition in their liver, there would definitely be a potential candidate for a liver transplant. And you'd also want to screen any siblings because this can be quite a hard diagnosis to catch. So once you do catch it, you would definitely want to screen any other kind of young family member to make sure that they aren't at risk of developing the condition later in life. 
because it's one of those things that you can treat. But once it has occurred, it's very you can't really reverse it. So you want to catch it as quick as possible and prevent it from happening kind of in the first place. So then you've also got hereditary hemochromatosis, which is caused by a mutation in the HFE gene or C282Y on chromosome six. And this is characterized by increased intestinal iron absorption in which you then deposit iron elsewhere within the body. And the symptoms you can find in this is kind of covered by the acronym MILS. So there's myocardial symptoms. So you'll get dilated cardiomyopathy from iron um, deposition in the heart. You can get endocrine symptoms. So you'll see bronze skin, which is a very common symptom for patients. Um, if you ever see an AKT or a patient with bronze skin, always think hemochromatosis. You can also get diabetes mellitus and hypogonadism. Um, you can also get arthralgia, so chondrocalcinosis, which is a deposition of calcium between the bone joints. So you can see that in the bottom right picture. You can kind of see some cloudy white opacification in the hand x-ray uh, between the ulna and the hand bones. And this is just chondrocalcinosis. You can also get liver conditions, so chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, which can then lead to hepatocellular carcinomas. And then, yeah, again, you can see the skin condition, so you can get a slate, gray, or bronze discoloration of the skin. And your diagnosis would be transferrin saturation of greater than 45%. You'd want to do HFE genotyping. Also consider an echo, because of, obviously because of the cardiomyopathy. And then on a liver biopsy, you see something called Pearl's blue stain, which is pathonomic for um, hemochromatosis. And then in terms of the management for this, there's something called venous section, in which Patients will present every week and have a certain amount of blood drained from um, basically taken out using venipuncture. And this is the main kind of treatment for hemochromatosis. But if a patient has any reason that they can't do this, potentially because of a really high INR or poor clotting, then you want to consider something called desphorioxamine, which is a iron chelating agent. So it kind of binds to the iron and prevents it from being deposited elsewhere. Um, and yes, yeah, so some differentials you'd want to exclude are thalassemia, sickle cell disease, chronic kidney disease, and hemophilia. So I think this is one of the last slides, and then we'll go on to the SP then we'll take a break and get on to the SBAs. So alpha, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. What alpha-1 antitrypsin is, is it's a protease inhibitor. So it prevents protease from basically degrading um, parts of the tissue, especially in your in your lungs and liver. So if you then have a deficiency in this, there's less inhibition of these um, enzymes and they will kind of eat away at your tissue in your liver and your lungs. So this is why you can find a lot of patients presenting with COPD-like symptoms. So um, kind of breathlessness, wheezes, um, COPD-like sounds on auscultation. Um, so if you ever see a young person presenting with COPD, it tends to be something that presents in older people. So consider things like alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And I think a common AKT question you would get is a patient presenting with both COPD symptoms and liver symptoms at the same time. Your main differential would want to be alpha, would want to be alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, to diagnose, you'd want to measure alpha-1 antitrypsin levels. And then in terms of management, you'd want to do smoking cessation, uh, provide supportive care, so bronchodilators and physiotherapy. You'd also want to trial uh, IV of alpha-1 antitrypsin. And then if it gets very severe, you would want to do things like lobectomies and liver transplants. Um, and I think this is the final slide. So this is acute liver failure, and it's focusing more on criteria for transplants, which are known as the King's College Hospital criteria. So there's two criteria for this. So if a patient presents with acute liver failure, the way you would kind of tell if they are up for a transplant or an immediate transplant is the first criteria is if the liver failure is caused by paracetamol overdose, you would want to look at the arterial pH. And if it's less than 7.3, they would be a candidate for an acute liver transplant. Or if they have all three of um, increased bleeding time, so a prothrombin time greater than 100 seconds, INR greater than 6.5, creatinine greater than 300, and grade three or four encephalopathy. This would also make them a candidate for a liver transplant. And then if the patient comes in with acute liver failure, which wasn't caused by a paracetamol overdose, you would then move on to these criteria, which is a prothrombin time greater than 100 seconds or any three of 
less than 10 years old or greater than 40, um, jaundice, which can lead to a coma that has occurred over seven days, um, bilirubin greater than 300, a prothrombin greater than 50, or its toxicity but of an unknown cause, which isn't paracetamol. Um, yeah, so now we're on to the SBAs. I appreciate that was a lot of stuff to go through in quite a short time. Um, we'll take a five minute break at this point and then I'll come back and do the SBAs. And if anyone has any questions, just put them in the chat and I'll try and answer them when we come back. So we just take a five minute break and please fill out the feedback form and just let us know how it's going so far.
I'll start on the SBAs. So can you still see my screen? Yeah, we can. Cool. So I'll go to the SBAs now. Uh, if anyone has any questions as well, either just put them in the chat or feel free to kind of just shout them out. So, so the first SBA is a 24 year old female is referred by her GP to ambulatory care with severe abdominal pain and a baseline blood are taken, which show and I'll let you guys read those. And then what is the most likely diagnosis based on this LFT picture? E. E, yeah. So, yeah, so the answer was E. So causes of an AOT greater than 1,000 are drug-induced liver um, conditions, acute viral hepatitis, and ischemic injury and autoimmune hepatitis. So if you ever come across the AOT being greater than 1,000, just consider one of those four. Um, so the next question, a 32-year-old pregnant female travels to Nepal to visit her family. She develops a fever and some yellowing of the skin, which causes her to become severely ill and develop subsequent hepatic failure. Attempt to resuscitate her fail and sadly she passes. What is the most likely cause? So the answer is E. So I think the visit to Nepal can be quite like a, you know, you may think hepatitis A or a different condition, but if ever there's a female who's pregnant and comes in with hepatic failure or liver conditions, hepatitis E should always be at the top of your kind of uh, differential list. So the next question, a 31 year old gentleman has unexplained raised LFTs in a routine blood check for his new employer. He's otherwise healthy and remains asymptomatic. A liver biopsy is performed, which shows ground glass hepatocytes. What's the most likely underlying diagnosis? So the answer is hepatitis B. So ground glass on biopsy is always just pathonomic for hep B. So um, that's just basically the reason for that one. So you're discussing alcohol consumption with a middle-aged gentleman who is due for discharge after an episode of acute pancreatitis. He tells you he currently drinks approximately three litres of cider, um, ABV 5%. Um, how many units is that per week? So you need to know the formula for calculating alcohol units, which is kind of something you either know or don't. But it's quite common on parsnip, I think. What's that mean? Um, it's D. So the calculation is volume in milliliters times the ABV and then divided by a thousand. And I think something that always kind of catches people out is make sure you know if it's per week, per day, because um, that will obviously change how much kind of units the person is drinking. And so the common advice for both men and women is you shouldn't drink more than 14 units a week and you should spread this evenly over three days or more to prevent kind of binge drinking or any kind of acute alcoholic liver diseases. So these are some common signs that you may see while, kind of either while you're on the ward or you may get shown pictures of these neuroskis. So I'll give you guys a few seconds to kind of go over these and come up with ideas of what you think they could be. So does anyone have any ideas of what the first one, the top left one, could be? So it's quite a tough picture to kind of see what they look like because it's taken from quite far out. But so the first one are um, spider nevi. So these are kind of almost small, just vessel like structures that you'll see on the skin. And um, the kind of general rule is that if you see five or more, then that's a, that's a positive finding. If you see two or three of these, then they won't be a positive finding and you can kind of ignore them. Does anyone know what the second one is? Colonicia? Yeah, so it's colonicia. 
So um, again, this is a common sign that when you're doing your OSCE examination and you're looking at the hand, you definitely want to keep an eye out for these and colonic or any kind of nail changes. Um, type uh, the picture three, this one with the hand. So this um, one again is so so that one's the so we'll get onto that one in a second. But oh, this right. one is quite hard to see, but it's Dupuytren's contracture. So if you can kind of see with the ring finger, you can almost see the tendon sheath and the ring finger when he when the hand is put flat onto the table, it's still kind of lifted and um, flexed almost. So that's kind of a sign of severe alcohol use um, in a patient. And it's something you want to look out for on your abdo exam. Does anyone have an idea what picture four is? Cat Medusa. Yeah, so this is Cat Medusa. Um, again, a sign of kind of end stage liver disease or portal hypertension. Um, and, and then, yeah, like you said earlier, so picture five is palm erythema. Again, a sign of end stage liver disease. Does anyone know what six is? Leukonychia. Yes. So yeah, again, another kind of nail change that you want to look out for on your OSCEs, which could be a sign of uh, kind of a liver condition or iron deficiencies. Um, number seven is quite a common one. Definitely something that you should always look out for on the hepatology ward or gastro ward. So it's scleral. Uh, yeah, so it's, it is jaundice, yeah, but another word is scleral icterus, whenever it's in the eyes, because the eyes are the easiest place to see jaundice. It can present quite late in terms of the skin becoming yellow, but because uh, it's quite easy to see on the eyes and it's quite severe in this patient. And then the final picture. Ascitis? Yeah, so this is quite severe ascites. And again, this is something that you might get examined on in your OSCEs. So a way that they may ask you to assess for ascites, either on the wards or in your OSCEs, would be something called shifting dullness. And this is basically when you percuss across the patient's abdomen. And if you hear any signs of any specific dullness in certain areas, so if you were to percuss and, feel dull and hear dullness on the right side, you would then want to get the patient to turn to the opposite side, so their left side, wait for around 30 seconds so the acidic fluid falls down to the left side and percuss again in which you would hear a more resonant sound because the fluid has dropped down away from where you're percussing um, and that would be a positive sign of ascites so again this is a, um, a sign of severe liver decompensation or portal hypertension um, and then another SBA so a 61 year old gentleman is on the hepatology ward following a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt he has become acutely confused with a low-grade fever and is exhibiting a flapping tremor, given the likely diagnosis which medication is indicated. Is it e? So, yeah, so E. So the patient's presented with hepatic encephalopathy, secondary to their TIPS procedure. And the first line for this is lactulose, so you want to give your... Um, your laxatives to prevent any kind of nitrogenous waste in GI absorption. Um, so a woman consumes between 80 to 100 units of alcohol per week. She has slight ascites but no evidence of encephalopathy. Her prothrombin time is prolonged by three seconds and the hepatologist in charge asks the SHO to assess his risk of variceal bleeding using the child pew score. Which single pair of additional variables should be used to grade her risk? So the child pew score wasn't something we covered in this presentation, but I would definitely take a look at it before your exams. It's basically a score used to assess end stage kind of liver conditions, and it consists of albumin levels, bilirubin, coagulopathy, distension, and encephalopathy. So it's quite a hard question to put, seeing we haven't covered it, but I would definitely take a look at it before you guys go into your AKTs or before you go into the hepatology wards, because it's definitely something that will come up. Um, so a 24-year-old female was diagnosed two months ago with Wilson's disease and started on penicillamine therapy. 
She calls her GP today, reporting a temperature and a sore throat and notes marked bruising on his legs in the last week. What advice should the GP offer? So the answer to this would be ask the patient to come in for an urgent blood test. So this was quite a hard question, but um, so a risk of penicillamine therapy is agranulocytosis. And this is a kind of an important risk in which you'll get um, kind of a complete drop in your white blood cells, your red blood cells, your platelets, and it can occur from a lot of medications. So penicillamine being one, methotrexate, clozapine, carbamazepine, and whenever you're counseling patients on any of these medications, if ever they, some kind of um, signs that you, warning signs that you'd want to tell them about is if they come in, if they start the medication and have any kind of flu-like symptoms, you'd want to tell them to come to A&E as soon as possible. So this would be some kind of signposting you would do whenever you're counseling for any of these medications. And then a 45 year old man presents with chronic progressive pain in his MCP and PIP joints. He does not complain of stiffness, but mentions that he is inca incapable of ma maintaining an erection. On examination, he has a gray slate discoloration of the skin, mild hepatomegaly and swollen joints. Given the likely diagnosis, what treatment is he likely to be given? E. Yes, so E. So the patient's coming with hemochromatosis. He has the gray or bronze discoloration. He has um, swollen joints. So it's probably from chondrocalcinosis. Um, and yeah, so the first line would be venous section. If he wasn't eligible for venous section, then you'd want to consider desphoreoxamine. Um, and so the next question, I think the final question, a 19 year old girl is admitted to A&E after her sister found her unconscious next to three empty packets of paracetamol. She is stable, but on day three of admission, she rapidly deteriorates with confusion, jaundice, feta, hepaticus, and two episodes of seizing. She's reviewed by hepatology to consider listing her for urgent liver transplants. Which of the following could prevent her from being listed? So this is quite a tough question and it's something that is kind of less about knowledge and more like a skill that you might need to use in your AKTs. So the answer is E, so it's known anorexia nervosa. Um, and the reason it's quite a hard question is because this uses the King's College criteria for a paracetamol um, kind of overdose. And so this isn't exactly something you'd be expected to know that anorexia means you can't have a transplant. But as you know that these are all markers that a patient is very likely to need a transplant, you need to kind of know that you should cross them out as potential reasons and then just basically answer with whatever you've been given left. So it's not something you'd necessarily need to know for an exam, but in terms of exam technique, you always kind of just want to cross off all the answers that you know can't be true and then use the final answer that you're kind of left with, which in this case is anorexia nervosa because the other four are part of the King's College um, criteria for liver transplants. So I think we can either take a five minute break or go straight into um, pancreatico biliary. It's up to you guys. I don't mind continuing, but unless you yeah. want a break. <laughs> um, that's my section finished. I think Vidika's taking okay. over the next stage. But yeah, I, I appreciate that was a lot to cover in quite a short amount of time. So if you guys have any questions, either let us know at the end or feel free to kind of get in contact with any of us or email any of us. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll pass on to Vidika. Um, let me just share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. OK, perfect. Um, so I'm aware it's almost 7.30, so I'll try not to take too much of your time. Um, it is a small section anyway, so it shouldn't take too long. And any questions you can ask us at the end. Um, OK, so 
let's first just go through some terminology. I think words can just be thrown around quite a bit and it's really hard to know what each word means. Um, so firstly, cholelithiasis, I struggle to pronounce as well, which basically means stones in the gallbladder. Um, biliary colic means that stones are just temporarily stuck in the ducts um, and that could also be due to ductal spasms as well. Um, because it's temporary, the pain sort of comes and goes, which I'll come to in a second as well. Cholecystitis is when the stone is stuck in the biliary duct or the cystic duct and the gallbladder becomes inflamed or infected as a result. Um, Cholidocolithiasis is when the stone is stuck in the common bile duct. There is a diagram on the right as well, so you can like, picture where exactly the stone is stuck as well. Ascending cholangitis is when the stone is stuck in the common bile duct and the common bile duct gets, gets inflamed or infected as a result. Um, Mirizzi syndrome, this is kind of hard to picture um, because it can look very similar to ascending cholangitis in terms of its presentation, but it's different in the sense that the stone actually still blocks, is stuck in the cystic duct, but it's so big that it presses on the common bile duct as well. Um, and hence you end up with cholecystitis with jaundice, um, which would make you think ascending cholangitis as well. But yeah, it's hard to distinguish between the two unless you get some imaging done. But yeah, um, Mirizzi syndrome is when the stone is in the cystic duct, but it's so big that it blocks the common bowel duct as well. And gallstone ileus is when the gallstone gets stuck in the bowel. Okay, so gallstone disease. Um, Symptoms tend to be right upper quadrant pain, um, typically radiating to the shoulder and postprandial pain as well. So pain after eating meals, particularly fatty meals. Um, you may see that in the SBA stem as well. Um, and that should indicate gallstone disease or some form of biliary colic as well. And some risk factors include obesity and um, the female gender as well. Investigations that you do, liver function tests and ultrasound scans to see um, where the stones actually are. And um, if you can't detect the stones by ultrasound, you do an MRCP. Um, in case you guys aren't aware what an MRCP is, it's kind of a procedure where you have a camera that's put down your throat um, and then you can get some uh, X-ray images taken of the whole like biliary tree as well. And in terms of management, if it's asymptomatic gallstones, you re just reassure the patient and get them to come back if the pain doesn't go away or it gets worse, um, just make sure to safety net them. Um, but if the gallstones are symptomatic, then you want to refer the patient for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which is essentially um, a minimally invasive procedure where you remove the gallbladder. You guys might have the chance to see that on placement as well, which is quite interesting. Um, if the stones are just stuck in the bile duct, you may not necessarily want a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, if it's not cholecystitis, you might just do an ERCP and then you can have a stent put in to open up the um, common bile duct um, and to allow the bile to flow. Okay. So it's important to know the distinguish, uh, how to distinguish between cholecystitis and ascending cholangitis. So like I said earlier, cholecystitis is when the gallstone is stuck in the cystic duct, whereas ascending cholangitis is when the stone is stuck in the common bile duct. So the location is important. Um, so with cholecystitis, you'll see fever, right upper, right upper quadrant pain and Murphy's sign. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know what Murphy's sign is. It's what you um, sort of get on examination. Um, if when you're trying to palpate the liver, um, when the patient takes a deep breath in, they almost won't be able to because they're in so much pain and that's called the Murphy's sign. You won't see any jaundice unless it's Mirizzi syndrome. Um, essentially to have the presentation of jaundice, the common bile duct needs to be blocked. Hence why you have jaundice in ascending cholangitis and not cholecystitis. Um, for ascending cholangitis, as a, so that means you have the triad of um, Charcot's triad, fever, right upper quadrant pain and jaundice. For cholecystitis, your primary investigation is an ultrasound. Um, if that doesn't work, then an MRCP. Um, for ascending cholangitis, you do blood culture, do an ABG, 
as well as an ultrasound because you're just thinking about sepsis as well always for both if it's a, an infection uh, which it is then it you need to uh, give the patient some IV antibiotics as well. For cholecystitis, you do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, but for ascending cholangitis, you do an ERCP, and that is just because of the difference in location of the gallstone. Does that make sense? Um, okay. Another thing um, in your core conditions list, um, two conditions, primary sclerosing cholangitis and primary biliary cirrhosis. Um, so in terms of pathology for both, PSC tends to affect intra and extra hepatic ducts, and it is the progressive obliterative fibrosis, whereas PBC only affects the intrahepatic ducts and its granulomatous inflammation. Now, in terms of a typical SBA stem, for PSC, you'll, uh, you'll most likely say something like male with a past medical history of ulcerative colitis uh, presents with jaundice, dark urine and pale stores. Um, there is a strong association between PSC and ulcerative colitis, and most people that have PSC will have ulcerative colitis as well. That's not true for the opposite, like uh, pe people that have ulcerative colitis don't necessarily all have PSC, if that makes sense. But people that have PSC most likely have ulcerative colitis. Um, for PBC, a typical SBA will say that um, a female is presenting with itchy skin, has jaundice and steatorrhea, which is essentially just fatty stools. Um, and there are differences in the cancer that is associated with each condition. For PSC, um, colorectal cancer and cholangiocarcinoma, um, you're more at risk of developing those. But for PBC, you're more at risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma, which kind of makes sense if PBC only affects the intrahepatic ducts, hence just hepatocellular carcinoma, whereas PSC is extrahepatic as well, so cholangiocarcinoma. Um, another thing to note is that PBC also has this strange association with, with, with Sjogren's. I don't know if you guys have done your room um, rheumatology rotation, but there is an association between the two. So sometimes in SBAs, you may see um, a patient that also has uh, symptoms of Sjogren's as well. So like dry mouth, um, dry skin as well. Um, in terms of diagnosis for PSC, uh, you do a P anchor uh, blood test um, as well as an MRCP. And you typically see a beads on string kind of picture. And on biopsy, you'll see an onion skin fibrosis. For PBC, um, you do the anti-mitochondrial antibody as well as an IgM biopsy and you'll see a granuloma and bile duct loss as well. In terms of treatment, for PSC, you give cholestyramine and ERCP if there's a stricture to sort of open up the bile duct and relieve any um, signs of obstruction. But there isn't any real treatment for PSC, uh, just symptom management and sort of ultimately patients will need a liver transplant if um, you want the condition to completely just go away. Um, same for PBC, you'd give a uh, so deoxycholic acid or cholestyramine to sort of control symptoms, um, but ultimately the patient would need a liver transplant. Um, okay, so acute pancreatitis. Uh, this is essentially the inflammation of the pancreas, secondary to enzyme-mediated autodigestion. Um, and it typically presents with severe epigastric pain that spreads to the back, so it's kind of like a band. Um, you'd see some rigidity on examination as well as abdominal guarding. The patient is likely to have vomiting as well as a low-grade fever. You may also see some bruising. Um, so you can see the images on the bottom right corner, the Cullen sign and Gray Turner sign. The way I remember the location of each. Um, so think, imagine that you're turning to your side. So the Gray Turner si sign is on your flanks and the Cullen side is just the other location. So peri umbilical. Um, a thing to note is that on uh, when you do a blood test, you should always ask for amylase to be done. And you typically see an amylase that is three times the upper limit of normal. And that sort of just tells you immediately that it's acute pancreatitis. Um, in terms of management, just remember the surgical six. It's a safe bet in OSCE exams. Um, 
Firstly, you want to make the patient kneel by mouth, especially if they're vomiting. And you need to give them IV fluids as well, because if they're vomiting, they're losing a lot of fluid and you need to rehydrate them. If you're suspecting an infection, you'd give them antibiotics. And if their vomiting is so severe, you can consider antiemetics as well. Obviously, the patient is in a lot of pain, so you'd want to give them analgesia. And you'd also want to consider a surgical referral for ERCP, as quite often um, a major cause of acute pancreatitis is gallstone disease. So again, a gallstone being stuck um, in the pancreatic duct. Um, just some causes. You can remember the mnemonic, I get smashed. But the main, main ones really to know are gallstones and alcohol, um, big causes of acute pancreatitis. Um, just another thing to know about the amylase, the amylase levels do not necessarily correlate with severity. So an extremely high amylase level does not mean that the pancreatitis is severe. Um, just know that if it's raised, it is likely to be pancreatitis. Um, you may also hear uh, lipase that can be measured as well. It is more sensitive and specific than amylase, but not really used in the acute setting. So in an SBA, if you have the option of amylase and lipase, you should just always select amylase because that's what is used in the acute setting. Um, however, lipase does stay higher. Um, the levels stay higher for longer um, because it has a longer half-life. So let's say a patient comes in and they've been with, having symptoms for the last couple of days, not just a few hours. In a situation like that, you'd want to do lipase because then it will remain high for a longer period of time. So it's useful in late presentations, basically. Um, in terms of management, you may see the Glasgow criteria come up in exam questions. A way to remember it is with the mnemonic pancreas. Um, I wouldn't too worry too much about knowing what each of the thresholds are. Um, the main ones I think I remember are just calcium, um, urea, um, neutrophil count, as well as sugar levels as well. Those are kind of just the main ones, particularly calcium that comes up a lot. Um, hypocalcemia means um, a poorer prognosis, basically. And you would transfer to ITU at 24 hours if Glasgow score is greater than or equal to three. CRP is greater than 150. You have a BMI of more than 30 and if there's persistent multi-organ failure. Um, and in terms of uh, grading, the Glasgow score, mild is just a score of one, moderate is a score of two, and severe is a score um, greater than or equal to three, hence the transfer to ITU. Um, now, after the episode of pancreatitis resolves, some people may have a pancreatic pseudocyst developed, develop, which is essentially a collection of fluid in the pancreas um, and it's walled by fibrous or granulation tissue but it lacks an epithelial wall and the way a patient may present is just persistent abdominal pain and you can kind of feel a mass when you examine them and the amylase will persistently be elevated but very mildly not enough to give a diagnosis of pancreatitis. Um, if a patient has a pseudocyst, um, the way you'd investigate that is by ultrasound or CT, but you try to avoid a CT if they're young. And in terms of management, you firstly just reassure the patient. Most of the time it does go away, but if it doesn't resolve um, for many, many weeks or if it's quite a large cyst, then you can um, refer the patient for a procedure called cystogastostomy which is essentially creating an opening between the pseudocyst and the stomach so all the fluid can drain into the stomach and then out of our digestive system. OK, now in terms of our oncology. Um, so the main cancers to note for this whole topic, pan pancreatic cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma. Um, just some distinguishing features. For the pancreas, um, if it's a cancer in the head of the pancreas, you'll always see sort of painless obstructive jaundice, which is um, which is uh, called Voisier's law. So in the presence of painless obstructive jaundice and a palpable gallbladder is unlikely to be caused by gallstones. Essentially, just if you have if a question in a question, a patient has obstructive jaundice but they're not in any pain, you should always, always suspect pancreatic cancer. Just always have a low threshold 
especially because it has such a poor prognosis as well. Um, so just have a low threshold for suspicion. You may also see trisocyne, which is migratory thrombophlebitis. It's also seen in small cell lung cancer as well. First line investigation would be um, an ultrasound and then you'd use a CT to stage the cancer. And as with any cancer, the main sort of streams of management are surgery, radiotherapy or chemotherapy. For pancreatic cancers, the name of the surgical, surgical procedure is called Whipples. Um, if you Google it, you can see um, exactly how what is removed. But it's the head of the pancreas, a bit of the duodenum as well. Um, it's quite a big procedure, um, but that's how pancreatic cancers manage. And then chemotherapy as well later on. OK, so for hepatocellular carcinoma in the UK, the main sort of cause is hepatitis C virus. Um, but globally, the main cause is hepatitis B. Um, you'd see ascites, encephalopathy, jaundice, chronic liver disease. Um, I think Max mentioned earlier that the uh, the marker is um, AFP, so you'd want to do the test for that, um, as well as having six monthly ultrasounds um, and a biopsy for a definitive diagnosis as well. Again, management, surgical resection. You could have something called a transarterial chemoembolization done as well, um, or you can have the patient put on a liver transplant list. Cholangiocarcinoma, 80% um, of the cases are extrahepatic. Again, the patient will present with jaundice. Risk factors include PSC and ulcerative colitis. First line investigations are MRCP and then the CT to stage the cancer. Again, management, surgical resection, but quite often um, the care has to be more palliative. Um, so you can have a stent put in via an ERCP um, just to manage the patient's symptoms. Um, another thing to note, um, if you see a in a, an SBA, if you see a, fifth, a woman uh, older than the age of 50 with recurrent IBS symptoms, you might want to suspect ovarian cancer and you'd want to do a CA125 screen as that's the tumour marker. But I wouldn't worry too much about that right now because that might also be more fifth year. Um, and here is just a nice little table for the tumour markers. Pancreatic cancer, CA199, cholangiocarcinoma, CA199, as well as CEA. CEA is also the marker for col colorectal cancer, um, which will come up in later tutorials. HCC is alpha fetoprotein and ovarian cancer is CA125. Very important to know these tumour markers because it could easily come up in SBAs and it's just simple marks. OK, now to move on to SBAs, feel free to just shout the answer out or put it in the chat up to you. So a 47-year-old woman has generalised pruritus, jaundice, dry eyes and mouth. Pruritus is basically itchy skin. Um, she's otherwise well and drinks no alcohol. She has a markedly raised alkaline phosphatase. What is the most, which is the single most useful investigation? Anyone? OK, so the answer for this is D. So um, if a woman presents with jaundice, itchy skin, dry eyes and mouth, dry eyes and mouth is indicative of Sjogren's, which I mentioned earlier. Um, oh, and you'd want to suspect PBC as well with a raised alkaline phosphatase. So you'd want to do the anti-mitochondrial antibody. Again, it's just easy to learn the antibodies because they're quite easy marks to get. So yeah, that's PBC. Next question. A 23-year-old Caucasian male presents with a history of transient jaundice. You asserted that this becomes noticeable after periods of increased physical activity and subsides after a few days. Who reports no other symptoms other than a recent viral infection. His FBC is normal, but his LFTs reveal a bilirubin of 37. What is the most appropriate management? Any guesses? I have not covered this in the previous slides, but it's a very small fact that you need to know. So this SBA will cover it. Any ideas? Just A. Sorry? Can it be A? Yeah. 
So this is essentially a diagnosis of Gilbert syndrome, which is an autosomal recessive disorder. And all you need to know is really if you have a young patient that, you know, has jaundice after periods of stress, such as physical activity or um, during exam season or after an infection, um, and all other tests are normal, just a raised bilirubin, then just reassure the patient the bilirubin will drop down again and it's just Gilbert's syndrome. Okay, a 38 year old man presents to A&E after being bitten by a dog in the park. He is assessed, given a tetanus booster and antibiotics to cover for infection. He visits the GP a week later after noticing a yellow tinge to his eyes and now his skin. Which of the following medications is the most likely cause of this presentation? Any ideas? Me? Yeah, so it's Kermoxiclav. Um, if uh, anyone has an animal bite, first line they're given Kermoxiclav. Um, so that's the first clue there. And then yellow tinge to his eyes, so he's obviously getting some jaundice. Um, some medications like Kermoxiclav, as well as the combined oral contraceptive pill, flucloxacillin, erythromycin, etc., is right at the bottom they can cause um, a bit of jaundice and, and you can see a cholestatic picture on the liver function tests as well. So you'll see a raised ALP and um, a raised GGT as well. That's a cholestatic picture. Um, okay, a 54 year old woman presents to a &E with a three month history of intermittent right upper quadrant pain, which she describes as sharp in nature and complaints of radiation to her shoulder. On examination, there is no jaundice or organomegaly. Her obs is stable and she is afebrile. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. A, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So the clue is in the word intermittent, so it's not permanent. Again, if it comes and goes, you should think biliary colic. Um, as I said earlier, this is typically right upper quadrant pain that is worse after fatty meals. Um, and in the table at the bottom, you can kind of see the differences between each condition, which I mentioned earlier as well. Um, for cholangitis, um, you can also get Reynolds pentad. So it's basically Charcot's triad. So fever, right upper quadrant pain and jaundice, as well as um, a low blood pressure and confusion as well. So hence the pentad. So it's the triad plus these two other signs of confusion and low blood pressure. And if anyone has Reynolds pentad, they're basically quite septic and quite serious as well. So they need to be treated ASAP. Um, I think this is the last question. A 42 year old woman presents to a &E with epigastric pain, which started two hours ago. The woman describes the pain as sharp and radiating to the back. She says she feels nauseous but has not vomited. She responds well to IV fluids and analgesia. Her blood results show the following. Um, you can see from the blood tests that the ALP is quite significantly raised and the amylase is as well. So what is the most appropriate investigation? CT. Not quite. So if you have raised, if you have a raised ALP, you're suspecting something to do with gallstone disease. Um, and obviously, if you have a, a, an amylase that high, so three times the upper limit of normal, um, you're suspecting acute pancreatitis as well. And remember, one of the major causes of pancreatitis is gallstones. And the first line investigation for gallstones is abdominal ultrasound. So A is the right answer for this. OK, um, so hep hepatitis serology should have been covered in one of the previous tutorials as well. But yeah, that's all for pancreatic biliary. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. And please, could you all fill in the feedback form as well? We'd really appreciate it. Thank you.
um, if anyone has any feedback that they'd just like to tell us over the call right now in terms of tutorials, anything you'd like us to improve, anything to add, etc., you can do that verbally as well. Otherwise, just fill in the feedback form. Thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.